Okay, so um, hi everyone. Um, this is some a project I've started towards the end of my PhD uh, that I hope to continue in the future as well. And it, it's been just very recently accepted to care this year. Um, so um, computing has come a long way. Um, it, we're able to prove theorems, and do math, um, do constraint pro uh, optimization and, and sat satisfiability problems. Uh, recently, we've also seen some advances in, in generating textual and visual data. And yet there are some problems where we pose a simple problem. Uh, it has a simple solution, of course, and yet um, the algorithms often end up solving NP-hard problems unnecessarily. Um, and I would say that some, some variants of, of counting are uh, such problems. So um, counting um, has a lot of applications particularly for probabilistic inference, uh, both for probabilistic programming languages and, um, and graphical models. Um, there are also recent applications to neurosymbolic artificial intelligence, um, natural language processing, particularly knowledge extraction. Um, there are some applications in robotics um, about learning relations between objects and how they can be manipulated. Uh, on um, in bi biomedical data, including diagnosis. And of course, mathematicians also care about counting. And in, in many cases, we've had quite a head start on, on many of these problems. Um, so I'm going to talk about logic-based um, approaches to counting. And in, in the very center, we have um, chart that the propositional model counting problem um, first described by Leslie Valiant when, when he introduced uh, RFP as a complexity class. Here um, we have uh, pro propositional variables. We have a formula using these propositional variables. And each interpretation is a subset of these variables where a variable in that subset counts as being set to, to true. Otherwise, it's set, it's, it counts as being set to false. Um, and uh, a model is an interpretation such that um, the formula evaluates the truth. Um, more recent, so um, the answer, the model count of this formula happens to be free, since it has three models that satisfy the formula. Um, more recently, um, the ADA emerged that we can add weights to the literals. Um, and model uh, probabilistic computations in this way. Um, so here, instead of um, an integer, we, the answer is a sum of products, um, where we have a term for uh, every model, and um, each term is a product of two weights for, uh, for the two uh, rituals in the model. Uh, and the goal of, of, of a weighted model counting algorithm is then to uh, compute the sum of products as efficiently as possible. Um, and this basic idea has been extended in three major directions. Um, first, we have the extension to first-order logic. Um, I'll, I'll describe the problem in more detail shortly, um, but here is a simple example. And if we have this formula for all x in delta p of x, now we have weights on, on predicates, and we have the positive weight and the negative weight. Um, and along with the input formula, we also have the, size of, the sizes of the domains. And here the answer happens to be the positive weight of predicate P uh, raised to the power of, of the size of the main delta. Um, the other, another major extension is that to continuous variables, supplementing um, summation with uh, integration. In the propositional setting, 
Um, this is known as weighted model integration. Um, in, in the first order, in the case of first order logic, um, weighted first order model integration has recently been proposed as well. Um, and the final extension is that to more general notions of weights. Um, so um, with algebraic model counting, um, non-negative non real numbers have been replaced with um, an arbitrary commutative summaring. Um, with my own previous work on pseudo-Boolean projection, we consider defining weights that are not directly tied to, to literals. So they can be mm, more, more succinct in, in, in special cases where that's mm, convenient for a problem. Um, and with summarizing programming, it, it attempts to combine, it's a formalism that attempts to combine all three of these things. So it supports arbitrary summarizings and, uh, um, and first order logic, and also considers um, various definitions of weights that are not just on literals or on predicates. Um, so in this talk, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on first order model counting, particularly the unweighted variant, although uh, everything extends to, to the weighted variant as well. Um, here is a, another example formula. So we have for all x in delta p of x or q of x. Um, and let's suppose that the domain just contains two elements. So then the interpretations are all subsets of, of the set with four elements. Um, and um, you can think of this instance as saying that each element of delta is either in P or in Q or in both. Um, so for, for both of these two elements, we have three choices. So that gives us nine models. Um, so for predicates of parity one, um, a, pred a predicate is like a subset. For, for higher arity predicates, they model relations. And then first order model counting um, is about co counting uh, the, the combinations of relations that satisfy the given constraints. Um, so more explicitly, we're working with uh, many sorted first order logic. So each element is, is assigned to a domain. We don't uh, do function symbols. Um, we support equality, both between variables and between a variable and a constant. Um, and we can have any number of variables. We can, all, all of the variables are bound, so we have no free variables. Um, we can have an arbitrary nesting of existential and, and, and universal quantifiers. Um, all domains are assumed to be finite, and to compute a numerical answer, we do, do need to know the exact sizes of the domains. And predicates can have any arity. <laughs> and this, this is not to say that we can solve any problem uh, position in this manner, but we still support that as an input. Um, here are all of the uh, algorithms that are used uh, for first order model counting. Most of them do some kind of knowledge compilation, usually to a variant of DDNNF. Um, one of them even does knowledge compilation directly to C++ code. Um, and there's also one algorithm that extends um, DPLL style search to, to this first order logic setting. And in this work, we take one of these algorithms, forklift, we combine it with the capability to uh, perform or model um, recursive computations. And we get this new algorithm called Crane. Um, so we, let's take the same formula as we had before and consider how, how first order knowledge compilation can and can find the answer to the model of this formula. Um, first, we can notice that whatever decision we make for one element of delta um, has no effect on, on any other element of delta. So um, we can replace this variable. We can use this independent partial branding rule. 
uh, to replace this variable with a constant um, and just reason about this simpler function and a simpler formula. Um, next, we can do Shannon decomposition. So we consider the case where Q of C is true and the case where Q of C is false. Um, in the first case, we can do uh, unit propagation of Q of C, and that leaves us with two leaf nodes for Q of C and, 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 and top methodology. Um, on the other side, um, we similarly do unit propagation, and here we get not Q of C and P of C. And now all of the uh, leaf nodes are pathologies and unit clauses. The compilation is now complete. Uh, next, we do smooth in, where we propagate atoms upwards. And we notice, and this is particularly relevant for the weighted setting to preserve weights of predicates, um, but it's also important for the unweighted setting as well. So we propagate sets of atoms upwards, and we notice that P of C exists on the right, but not on the left. So to preserve P of C, we introduce this new smoothing node and it just says P of C or not P of C. Um, so, that, so now we can do counting. Um, and we propagate um, weights upwards. Um, so in the unweighted setting, in the weighted setting, this would be the weights of the predicates in the unweighted setting, um, we usually just have a one for each leaf nodes, node with the exception of smoothing nodes and has a, a weight of two since it has both pred P of C and not P of C. Now, um, conjunction corresponds to multiplication. Um, this junction corresponds to addition. And then this independent partial grounding node um, raises whatever it gets from the, from the successor node um, to the power of, uh, of the size of, of delta. And that gives us our uh, model counting. Now, let's take a, a more complicated example. Let's suppose that this room has n seats, and there are m people in the audience, and we want to count the number of ways to seat everyone. So more explicitly, we assume that each attendee gets exactly one seat, and um, one seat can accommodate at most one person. Now, um, to count this, we could think like as follows. Um, the first person who comes in gets to choose one out of n seats. Um, the second person gets to choose one out of n minus one seats. Um, and that's the case for all m. Uh, attendees, um, which gives us this following factorial function. Um, and this counting problem is, is, is equivalent to counting injective functions from a set with m elements to a set with n elements. Um, now, we can model such a counting problem in logic. So we have two sets, um, or two domains, um, that model that the attendees and the seats. And we have this predicate P that models uh, the seating assignments. Now, we add a constraint saying that each attendee gets at least one seat. So for every element in, in gamma, there is an element in delta, such that they are paired together. Um, we can say that one person can occupy multiple seats. So. Um, when, whenever we have two seats assigned um, to the same person, um, we have that this, the two seats are, must be equal. And similarly, um, if we have two people um, sitting on the same seat, then those two people must be the same person. Um, and that models um, the injection counting problem. The first of the two constraints um, constrain this predicate P to be a function, and then the third one um, makes it injective. Um, now, let's see how recursion comes into play for, for solving these problems. 
So here is a recursive function that counts injections. And this is the kind of function that we can generate automatically. If we have no attendees and no seats, then we have a trivial solution of not doing anything. Um, if we have at least one attendee but no seats, then um, we can't do anything. Um, otherwise, um, we pick a seat and we either choose to do nothing with it or, or we assign it to one out of any attendees and we recurse on this uh, simpler uh, sub problem. <clears throat> Um, now, initially, you might see um, two function calls and assume that this must be inefficient. But with dynamic programming, we can compute it in uh, theta of n, n times n time, um, assuming that we can do each operation, multiplication, and, and addition um, in, in atomic time. Um, now, the optimal time is, of course, linear in n. Um, but this, this kind of qu quadratic seeming solution is still much better than the usual solution, which is translating everything to propositional logic and solving a sharply complete problem. Um, the rest of this talk is going to be about how um, we can construct these functions automatically. Um, so here is the previous um, first order knowledge compilation process. Um, we have a formula, we compile it to a circuit, and um, we take the main sizes and in the weighted setting weights as well, and we propagate them through the circuit to get the numerical answer. Now, here we're making this process quite a bit more complicated. First, we compile um, this formula to, to a graph that's no longer a circuit, it's, it can have cycles. Uh, then we interpret that graph as a collection of definitions of functions. We algebraically simplify these functions. And then to evaluate them, we need the main sizes as before. Right now, they, they also correspond to the arguments to the functions. And then for recursive functions, we also need the base cases. And then we plug, plug those in and we get the numerical answer. Um, in, in the paper, we describe how to automate the first two steps. Uh, very recently, we also automated the simplification step. And I think um, soon we will be able to automate all of that, including finding the base cases. Um, so previously, we had these circuits that extend DDNF circuits for, for propositional knowledge compilation uh, with more node types. Um, and as all circuits, they are acyclic. And here uh, we introduce these first order of computational graphs um, that are no longer acyclic. Uh, they are directed weakly connected graphs with a single source, labeled nodes, and ordered outgoing edges. Although there is only one small instance where that order matters. Um, here is a simplified version of, it, of a computational graph that models the, the recursive uh, function that we saw earlier. Um, each node has a type um, with some parameters that, uh, that I omit here. Um, here I highlighted the, the types that are either new or significantly changed since previous work. And then in order to turn this into definitions of functions, we traverse this graph. And um, for every node we visit, we might insert more details to, to the function definition. So in some cases, we don't add anything. In other cases, we, for example, here, we add a linear sum with binomial coefficients, and we introduce this new variable L. Um, here, again, we don't uh, add anything. With multiplication, we um, with a conjunction node we add multiplication. This contradiction node, with again with some parameters that I don't show here, um, restricts this new variable L to be less than two. And then this ref node gives us the, the recursive call. And um, 
since we, we know that L must be less than two, we can simplify this by plugging in the two values and we get this simpler expression that's more convenient to, to evaluate. Um, yeah, and these graphs are constructed using compilation rules. And this is a slightly more general definition from what was um, done previously. So a compilation rule takes a formula and returns a set of pairs. Each pair corresponds to a different way of applying that compilation rule uh, to that formula. Um, and we have, in, in each pair, we have uh, a graph, possibly incomplete, and the list of formulas. And then we still need, those formulas are formulas that we still need to compile. And as we compile them and turn them into graphs, we insert these graphs into this bigger graph G um, according to some set order. Um, here is a simple example of, of independence. So in this entire formula, we can notice that uh, the first clause only talks about the main omega. And the other two clauses talk about domains gamma and delta. So in a way, we can um, reason about them independently and then just multiply that the model. So the independence compilation rule returns this graph G with one conjunction node and two outgoing edges um, that are not assigned to anything yet. And then we have two uh, subformulas, the first one and, and, and this second and third clause. Um, once we compile this first subformula, we will insert it uh, to replace with green star. And, and compiling the second subformula will, will replace the purple star. Um, so the first um, compilation rule that we introduce is, is a more general version of domain recursion. Um, with domain recursion, we take, we choose a domain and uh, we introduce a new constant. And then for every variable associated with that domain, we consider two possibilities. Either it's equal to the constant or it's not equal to the constant. Um, so here in this example, uh, if we choose the domain gamma, um, in the first clause, we have this variable x replaced with, with this new constant c. And in the second clause, um, we have this additional constraint that x must not be equal to c. And so obviously this new formula is, is equivalent, assuming that the domain is not empty. Um, so domain recursion existed before, um, but it was only used in a very restricted sense where, where we could tell something about the resulting formula and we could split it into three parts and we would know how to compile each of the three parts. Here we um, just replace this smaller formula with a longer formula and let the remaining compilation rules handle this bigger formula. Um, now, uh, the next step is constraint removal. So after we introduce this new constant, and then we um, we potentially um, perform many other um, transformations on this formula, we might end up in a situation where uh, whenever we have a variable associated with this constant, we always have the restriction that it's not equal to C. In this case, we can um, introduce a new domain, which essentially is essentially interpreted as this domain gamma uh, minus the constant C. Um, and then we can replace the domain gamma with, with this new domain gamma prime and, um, and remove the, the, the inequality constraints. Um, and finally, we have this, this step that identifies possibilities for recursion. And the way we do that is um, we take this formula that, was, that we're trying to compile right now, and we compare it to formulas that we've encountered previously. Um, 
and we want them to be equivalent up to domains. Um, so we do some um, hashing-based uh, pre-processing to reject uh, pairs of formulas and pairs of clauses that can, are too different to be equivalent. But for all, all clauses that are sufficiently similar, um, we consider bijection between their sets of variables. And so far, all of the instances have usually two or three variables. So considering bijections is not too expensive. Um, we extend those to maps between sets of domains. Um, and if this new if, if, if this bijection makes the clause equivalent and um, this domain map is compatible with the domain maps we've uh, chosen previously, we move on to another pair of, pair of clauses until we pair up all of the clauses, in which case, um, we know that the two formulas are equivalent. Um, here is a, a larger example of how these uh, how these compilation rules fit together. So this is for um, previously I discussed um, uh, counting injections. This is a slightly shorter formula for counting partial injections. So we no longer have this requirement that for all x, there is a y. Um, first, we do generalized domain recursion. So we pick this domain gamma. And um, again, this first clause turns into these two clauses, where we replace x with c, and where we explicitly um, require them to be different. And the second clause turns into three clauses. Um, so we have two variables. Um, so we consider the possibility of um, of having W replaced with C and X not equal to C, um, X replaced with C and W not equal to C, and uh, both of them not equal to C. And the, the reason why we don't consider the case where both of them are equal to C is because we already have a constraint that they must be different. So such a clause would, um, would never be satisfied, or would, in this case, would always be satisfied. Um, so we can simply omit it. Um, then um, I still ended up skipping some of these details since, um, um, since the formula is a little bit long. Uh, we do atom counting and, and unit propagation. So with atom counting, we split this domain delta into delta top and delta bot. Um, and uh, for each of these subdomains, we assume that um, some atom with one variable um, within this domain, either for delta top evaluates to true, and for delta bot evaluates to false. Um, and that helps us. And this is the same step that introduces a linear sum with binomial coefficients. Um, and that simplifies the formula. Um, and unit propagation then simplifies it, simplifies it even further. Um, then we do constraint removal. Um, so again, we have the situation where um, domain gamma, um, whenever a variable is associated with this domain, um, we have a, a constraint that it's not equal to C. So we re replace with gamma with gamma prime. Then we have independence. Um, so the first clause only mentions domain delta top. And the other two clauses only mention the main gamma prime and delta bot. So we can reason about the two sub formulas independently. Um, so this first sub formula just becomes a um, contradiction clause um, or a contradiction node. Um, and this is the same clause that gives us the requirements for, for this new variable L to be less than two. Since um, the only way, um, the only way, um, 
this clause can be satisfied if, if this if, if this domain is if this domain is either empty or has one element. <clears throat> Otherwise, it will have two different elements, and this will evaluate the false. And with this other um, subformula, we notice that um, this subformula with the cap right now is exactly equal to the, the formula we just started with, except um, the main gamma is replaced with the main gamma prime, and um, delta is replaced with delta bar. So um, then the, the algorithm that constructs this uh, function definitions from, from this graph then looks at the relations between these pairs of domains. And so with, with gamma prime, we explicitly assumed it to be one less than gamma. So that gives us the recursive call of um, m minus one. And with um, delta bot, we get uh, m minus out, where um, since um, atom counting splits with the mean delta into two parts, one of them is, is of size L, the other one is of size N minus L. Um, okay. Um, so we mainly tested this approach with um, function counting problems. Uh, here in particular, I listed um, function counting problems between two different domains. And some of those uh, for that could already handle um, others. Um, here I listed the ones that were not possible before. Um, so mainly um, injections, partial injections, and bijections. Um, so with injections, we're able to do them in, in to do them in theta of n n time. Now um, if we look at um, so programs or, or ways of counting these functions that are suggested on, on for example, the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, um, or in some cases, it's, there are obvious efficient solutions. For injections, we can say that the optimal solution is linear, but quadratic time is still, um, is still an improvement over previous work. With partial injections, uh, the presumably optimal time is a bit more complicated, but uh, closer to, to um, what we get. And by the way, um, the two solutions for injections and partial injections are exactly the same, except for the base cases. And, and for bijections, we're able to do them in linear time, which is optimal. Um, and this is in contrast to um, so fast WFOMC is um, the only other algorithm that can solve phenomenal problems when they are encoded using um, counting quantifiers. Um, and we ran some experiments with this um, private, only privately available version of fast FOMC. Um, and we presented this uh, statistical argument that its growth seems to be at least an M to the fourth. Um, and this is actual learning time data as black spots in the, the quartic model fitted as a green line. Um, yeah, so a linear time over a quartic time is still um, a significant improvement. Um, now let's um, go back to the big picture and consider what we've learned. So um, I think it's an interesting um, new idea to do knowledge compilation on graph with resulting in graphs that can contain cycles. Um, as far as I know, no kind of um, knowledge compilation has ever been done in this way. Um, and these graphs, as well as circuits as they were defined previously, and um, define functions. Uh, and cycles in these graphs represent function recursive calls. And this can include more complicated things like mutual recursion, so function f calling function g and function g calling function f, and also function calls that have um, more complexity in the arguments 
So we can have um, some variable minus a uh, sum of some other variables minus an arbitrary constant. Um, although coming up with specific instances in first order logic where that is the solution can be quite tricky, but at least these things are possible in principle. Um, and this, this capability to build recursive solutions um, helps us solve counting problems that were previously beyond the reach of, of first order model counting. Um, and in some cases, even if um, an algorithm such as that and WFOMC um, can find uh, a polynomial type solution, we're still finding more efficient solutions with a lower degree polynomial. Um, and by, in, in some cases, by a large margin. Um, now, for future work, um, I think it would be interesting to look beyond first order logic. Um, so, in, so look towards even more expressive input languages that are not necessarily logics, but something based on logic um, that can, for example, describe specific computations, such as uh, double recursion, where we have f of, f of something, or, uh, or well-known sequences, like with the Fibonacci sequence. So um, when we have only one domain, this, um, this the model count of a formula can be seen as representing a sequence when when that that domain has is empty when it has one element when it has two elements and so on. Um, so I think it would be interesting to um, take specific computations or sequences and see what kind of formalism would be needed for for an algorithm such as Crane or for Fist to, to to construct a solution and. Um, and also, um, so the most common application for first order model counting is for probabilistic inference for Markov logic networks. Um, and so taking this somewhat re semi-realistic setting, suppose we have a Markov logic network that models some probability that a system might fail, um, where we have the main signs of describing numbers of various components, um, ways expressing probabilities that um, some component might fail or some combination of failures might lead to another failure. And we might be interested in, in minimizing this probability or understanding how it behaves. Um, so with something like Crane, we can express this probability P as a function of the domain sizes and the weights. And uh, whereas previously with first order model counting, we would typically only evaluate what that function on one point. So with this um, more expressive uh, format and um, some algebraic manipulation, we can uh, consider these more high level questions. We can consider how um, this probability P scales with um, the number of users of the system. We could uh, find combinations of the main sizes that keep this probability below some threshold. Um, or we might even turn to uh, continuous optimization and consider ranges of weights um, that keep um, this probability sufficiently small across a range of um, the main size values. So um, along with the main takeaway message that um, that um, introducing cycles to graphs can model recursive computations and recursive computations help us construct more efficient solutions and just solutions to problems that have not been solved before and not in this manner um, another takeaway is that when we have a representation of function itself we can reason um, in a more sophisticated ways than just having an, an evaluation of that function on a particular data point. Thank you. Good question. Sorry. Um, if you apply the, the rules of the formulas and split them up, 
and then you have your uh, your gamma and gamma prime. Then you can check the conditions of whether uh, your rule applies or not, whether you're going to do this reversal. What if they don't uh, have these properties? So when you conclude that you don't have this recursive property, what do you do then? Do you have to backtrack uh, back or what's the next step? Yeah, so there are um, re recursion is one of the rules that are considered. There are many others. Um, if none of them fits, um, so previously the algorithm was greedy search, um, but there is no reason to expect greedy search to be complete uh, for this. So we also we still support greedy search, but we also support a mix of greedy and breath search. So. Um, we we do uh, backtrack if if no rule applies, and um, and yes, with some of the rules we apply them automatically, like with unit propagation, um, we don't miss out on anything by applying unit propagation. Um, and um, so far, we don't have any uh, clear criteria that would definitely tell us that uh, we can abandon the search branch. Um, so we just stick to, um, um, breath research. Sure. So that's the difference with the compilation algorithm. So because they only go forward, they yeah. keep going, they will never back. So that's what you have with the, the graphs that you can, you can get easier to backtrack when you don't find the solution or when you don't fulfill the requirements. We get all the people just spawn. Yeah. No, it's all the same yeah. kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so at each um, node of the search tree, it's <laughs> uh, uh, partially filled graph. And we consider add, adding something to the graph. If, if nothing works, then we backtrack to, to the previous version of the same graph. Mm -hmm. Really good. Okay, my question I had is in the beginning, you mentioned that you keep it all in the focus, and where is your contribution? Does that mean that the contribution can easily get up to the other organisms you had on the slide? Or? Um, so I think the ideas of how these compilation rules are um, quite specific to, um, to how forklift approaches the problem. I think. Um, yeah, other algorithms just work in a very different way. Um, so I think it's just uh, for, for lift or, or similar approaches. Okay. And another question I had was related to something you mentioned uh, before the presentation. Do you think that this is important to help in, for example, influence in language of people? Uh, sorry, influence in languages like okay. Um, well, yeah, I think um, the main areas of applications are, well, typically Markov logic networks, but but it should be just as applicable to Prabhdog. And um, I think the main reason why this maybe hasn't catch on so, uh, so far is that um, um, with these algorithms, so we I, we can either find an efficient solution or we, or we just are not able to find any solution. But I think this this kind of um, first order model counting uh, should be part of um, of of, uh, of languages like Prabhu. Yeah. You're, you're saying that if you have to go to grounding, you also stop and train. You don't find a little solution, you just get no solution. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's still the case. Um, I, there is a way to um, ground, so do like a combination of compilation and, and grounding. I haven't tested how well that works. Um, and with with Crane, um, unlike with Forklift, we at least so far don't have a clear um situation where we know that we're not we will not be able to 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 find a solution so for example with um domain recursion we can keep it applying any number of times introducing any number of constants and um, so yeah it's <laughs> And that's my question about 
uh, your framework is topology uh, and binary means. Um, and the question around that is what class of specifications in that topology can you find a solution? I, I was confused because of what I was just right now. I told you initially, I thought it was kind of all cases, but that's I guess not true. Um, did you that's what you just said, by the way? Yeah, and, and also, um, you talked about these injections, injections, and two injections. Um, for, for those you had specified, yeah, but does that mean that only when you have a theory that expresses such a condition, it can happen, or are there only cases? That um, so, a lot of, especially mo more recent work on, on first order model counting, they define a, a particular fragment of first order logic that their algorithm is, is probably capable of handling. So far, um, I'm, I have a conjecture on, on such a fragment um, that's based on, on, on something like, um, Something like um, something like a more general version of, of these kinds of formulas, uh, in addition to what Fortlet was able to handle previously with, with two variable clauses. Um, yeah, so far there is no proof of that. Um, I, I'm hoping that this extends to, to many interesting instances. Because there is a difference in that you refer to kind of handle as we don't do not find a lifted rule or a way to lift it, but we still support that entire class of input programs in principle because you put away from you yes. just can't lift them. Yeah, so yeah. um just like Portlet um originally can yeah. can support any kind of input. Yes, yeah. Yeah. 